Well, good morning. Today, we're going to open up the book of Esther and enter into one of the Bible's great and compelling stories. This account of a young refugee woman, an orphan adopted by her cousin, being raised up to become the wife of one of the greatest kings in the greatest empires known to man, is fascinating. And it all came about by the hand of God. And as we shall see, for his good and sovereign purposes. God is never mentioned in the text of this book, but his presence is undeniable. Some Bible scholars over the centuries have questioned whether the inclusion of this book into the Holy Scriptures is correct because of the omission of God's name. But when we stand back and look at the story in its entirety, we see that the God of creation has his hand in all things, great and small, and that the arc of history is formulated and directed by our Almighty God. Esther, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, I had to practice that name, believe me. This was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles, and the princes and the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when those days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods, marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other with royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bizda, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass. You try that. Seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials. For she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within him. These first 12 verses set the table for the whole book. King Ahasuerus was the sovereign, the supreme leader over the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. The Mede in the Persian Empire was the one who had conquered the Babylonians and absorbed that kingdom into their own. Remember that Judah had been destroyed by the Babylonians and now the remnant of the Judeans that were subject to Babylon were subject to their new masters, the Medes and the Persians. Ahasuerus' predecessor was Cyrus. And Cyrus had allowed a contingent of the exiled Judeans to return to Jerusalem to reestablish the city 
and the temple. Ahasuerus, probably better known by his Greek name, Xerxes, which is a lot easier to say, was a very big deal. He had expanded the empire to 127 provinces. It extended from Egypt nearly to India. He was so rich that he showed it off by throwing a six-month-long feast just because he could. The text describes the furnishing of the palace, the white and blue linen curtains on silver curtain rods, marble pillars, couches of gold and silver placed on floors of alabaster, turquoise, white and black marble. This was a man at the pinnacle of worldly riches, power, and success. The text says that Ahasuerus' heart became merry with wine, and he called for his wife, Queen Vashti, to be brought before her, his guests so he could show off her beauty. Getting drunk and trying to be a show-off is not just the province of fools. Great men can become even greater idiots. Vashti probably didn't want to be paraded around like a circus animal, and she refused the summons. This is where the wheels come off of this fairy tale story, and the real world comes crashing into view. Instead of stepping back and looking at Vashti's point of view, Ahasuerus, let his sense of pride take over. Vashi had not obeyed the command of the king, and so by doing, had forfeited her right to become queen. The king's counselors also advised him that decisive action should be taken before all the wives in the kingdom took note of Vashti's disobedience and became disobedience themselves. We men have to stick together, don't we? Vashti would be banished, and the king would find someone else more worthy to be his queen. Esther, chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captain, captives, who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Mordecai was a fourth-generation captive who was living in the city of Shushan. He was raising his cousin, Hadassah, or Esther, who was an orphan. The text says that Esther was lovely, beautiful to behold. So the search for the new queen was now on in full swing. The kingdom was combed for beautiful virgins for a competition to see who the king would choose to replace Vashti. The selected candidates would be subjected to a year of beauty treatments in preparation for their audition with the king. Esther was somehow swept up into this huge production. Lo and behold, she won the competition and became the new queen. Mordecai had warned Esther not to reveal to anyone her ancestry, and she kept the secret of her her origins. Then Mordecai uncovered a plot by two of the king's servants to assassinate Ahasuerus. Mordecai informed Queen Esther, who in turn informed the king. The plot was uncovered, the miscreants were hanged, and the matter was recorded in the chronicles of the kingdom. Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 And these things King Ahasuerus promoted, after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of 
Hamadatha the Agagite and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants were, who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So here we are introduced to the villain of the story, Haman, a descendant of the Amalekites. Now the Jews and the Amalekites have a history of hatred for one another that goes clear back to the days of Moses. The prophet Samuel personally killed Agag, the king of the Amalekites, when King Saul spared when he destroyed their city. Haman didn't want to just kill Mordecai. He wanted to destroy all the Jews in the kingdom. Haman used all his power and influence as the second in command of the kingdom to convince the king that the Jews were a danger to the empire and they needed to be annihilated. The king approved the plan and told Haman to proceed. So Haman drew up a decree that called for the destruction of all the Jews in the kingdom in the twelfth month of the year. And it had to be sent to all corners of the empire in all the languages of the people of the empire. This was before the advent of the internet and it took several months to disseminate over the kingdom by courier and horseback. The Jews throughout the empire met the news with weeping, fasting, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Mordecai was seen by Esther's servants dressed in sackcloth and ashes and delivered the news to her. Queen Esther sent a trusted servant to Mordecai to find out the, the meaning of his behavior. Mordecai provided the servant with a copy of the edict and sent a message back to Esther that she must go before the king and plead for her people. Now let's remember that Esther had not disclosed to anyone that she was a Jew. The king had no idea that he had signed a decree to have his own queen killed. Esther also had another dilemma. No one could come before the king unless they were summoned. If you approached the king and he did not extend his scepter to accept your presence, you were killed. Esther, chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I shall go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him.
Mordecai said some really astonishing things in this passage. The first was that if Esther kept silent, another way of deliverance would come to the Jews. God is not mentioned by name here. But where else would deliverance come from? And by whose sovereign hand? Mordecai is alluding to a controlling force that governs the universe. And that force is not dependent upon the actions of men. Then we have this statement. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for a time such as this. This statement is truly the crux of the story of Esther. Theologians and expositors and preachers have feasted on this line for centuries. But it is so rich and so full of instruction and truth to the Christian walk that I I need to preach it and teach it again today. What does Esther have to do here? She has to put herself aside. She has to lay her life down. She has to die to herself. And church, we all know how hard that is to do. Matthew chapter 26 verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Our Savior modeled this in the Garden of Gethsemane, facing torture and death on the cross. He laid His life down, obeyed the will of the Father, not the will of His flesh. And as a result of His obedience, we were redeemed. A very good thing in my estimation. John chapter 12, verses 23 through 26. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. I never caught the full impact of this verse until it came into my mind when I was preparing this sermon. A grain of wheat is a kernel that grows with several other kernels to form a head on the top of the wheat stalk. To be productive, that grain must fall to the ground and be buried in order for it to sprout and grow and to produce more grain. Unless that kernel dies... It can never reach its full potential. So it is with us. We must, to paraphrase Micah, we must live our lives with integrity, live mercifully, and walk humbly before our God. And don't make these things a matter of works. Let them become a way of life, because truly that's what they are, the way to true life. So let's get back to our story. Esther goes before the king and he extends his scepter and asks her what he can do for her. She invites the king and Haman to a banquet that she has prepared that day. The king gladly accepts and he and Haman come to the feast. The king asks Esther again what he could do for her and he indicates the high favor in which he holds her by offering her half the kingdom. Esther just requests that the king and Haman return tomorrow for another feast. Haman left the banquet elated, self-satisfied, until he ran into Mordecai at the gate. 
And Mordecai again refused to show him any respect. And Haman was furious when he returned to his house. His wife urged him to build a gallows on which to hang Mordecai, and that's exactly what he did, with the intent to ask the king for permission to fulfill the deed the next day. Esther, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. That night, the king could not sleep, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king asked him, What shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Oh boy, what a setup. Here is the king asking Haman what should be done for a man that the king wishes to honor. And Haman, thinking that that man to be honored is himself, goes on at great length to describe all the honors that should be bestowed upon this hero. The king wholeheartedly agrees and commands Haman to go and personally bestow those honors upon Mordecai. Haman slinks out of the throne room and goes to find the man who a few minutes earlier he was going to petition the king to kill and puts him on a horse in a fine robe and parades him around the city. But it's not over for Haman. There's more to come. Esther chapter 7 verses 1 through 6. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day, at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request up to half of the kingdom? It shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition, for my people at my request. For we have been sold my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, (coughs) The adversary, an enemy, is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Haman is executed on the gallows that he had erected for Mordecai. Esther is given Haman's house and all his possessions. She and Mordecai petitioned the king to revoke the decree to annihilate the Jews in the kingdom. The king assents and commissions them to write a new decree and send it out to the kingdom. The Jews are allowed to defend themselves against their adversaries. They overcome their enemies and the people are saved through Esther and Mordecai. And I would add, by the providential hand of God. Psalm chapter 37, verses 12 to 15. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. 
the wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. These are some profound words from one of my favorite psalms. The evil plan for others will surely be returned to the heads of those who plan it. The righteous hand of God may sometimes seem to be missing or to be slow in coming, but rest assured, loved ones, it will come in God's time and in God's way. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. We need to live like we believe that. We are not orphans cast adrift in an uncaring world with no hope. God Himself is our Father, our Advocate, the author of our salvation. As Paul says, if He is for us, who can be against us? Was it happenstance that Vashti was removed as queen? Happenstance that a Jewish orphan was her replacement? Happenstance that Mordecai uncovered a plot to assassinate the king? Happenstance that Esther was highly favored by the king and her petition was heard and approved? Happenstance that the king couldn't sleep and looked up the chronicles of the kingdom? (laughs) Happenstance that Haman ended up honoring his avowed enemy and was hanged on the very gallows that he had erected for Mordecai? Each one of these instances may be considered a happenstance by itself. But when you stand back and look at the whole of them, you realize that there was something else going on here. God had a covenant with the Jewish people. And a Messiah would arise from this nation in the fullness of time. The time had not happened yet. And God is a covenantal God. He keeps His word. This nation would continue under His providential hand. So how how shall we sum up this story and its significance for the modern church? Esther and her people had been removed from their homeland by force and relocated into a country that was not their own. Devout Jews did not fit into this strange new culture, and the native peoples were quick to mock and persecute them. They were banished from their homeland by God for their disobedience. But certainly God had not abandoned them. Fast forward to the early church in the time of the Acts of the Apostles. The Roman Empire in those times was as immoral and idolatrous as anything seen before or since. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet the church thrived and flourished in this time, even through periods of extreme persecution. Happenstance or by the hand of a sovereign God? And what about us here today in the middle of a culture that has completely lost its mind? Are we to shrink and hide, insulate ourselves from unbelievers, tremble in fear over the state of the world? As the Apostle Paul would say, certainly not. God has shown over and over and over again that He is faithful and true. He keeps His word. He has promised to never leave us or forsake us. We may never be asked to stand up and put our life on the line like Esther and countless other saints have, but we should be ready to. Remember, loved ones, we are the salt and the earth and the light. We have 
what the world needs. And we are commanded to go and share it. Don't count the cost. Instead, look forward to the reward and eternity with our beloved Savior. Amen?